broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. Tonight we wish to continue the series that we are now undertaking on the subject, the future of sports. We would like to give special attention this evening to three subtopics of that major topic. Those being competition in sports, secondly, inner self and in sports, and third, little league competition. It is my pleasure on behalf of our staff to welcome as our guest this evening the following people. First of all is Mr. Larry Kentop, who has been for several years the baseball coach and now is athletic director at Gonzaga University. Secondly is Mr. Marv Harshman, who formerly was basketball coach at Washington State University and now coaches the varsity team at the University of Washington in Seattle. And third is Dr. Ross Cutter, who for many years has been the tennis coach at Whitworth College and also teaching in that field. Uh, gentlemen, it's a pleasure having you on our program. Thank, Thank you, Tony. Thank you. It's also a privilege of mine to welcome to join with me in questioning our guest, three panel members. Uh, first of all is a regular member of our panel, uh, Mary Lou Reed, holding a bachelor's degree from Mills College and did her graduate work in religion at Columbia University in New York City. Welcome, Mary Lou. Thanks, Tony. It's also a privilege to have from our campus, Dr. Les Hogan, who is the Dean of Men of our campus to join the questioning. Welcome, Les. Thank you, Tony. And third, we have Mr. Rowley Williams, who is the North Idaho College Athletic Director. Welcome, Rowley. Thank you. We'll proceed to questions, and the first series will come from Mary Lou Reed. Well, I think I'd like to begin with you, Mr. Harshman. You talked today to the students at North Idaho College about the true meaning of competition. And I have a friend who says it's not how you play the game, it's whether you win or lose. Now, was your message today that the real meaning of competition is to win, or was it something else? I think it's a combination, Mary Lou, of really uh, I think we all strive to do the best job we can at whatever field of endeavor we're undertaking, whether it's athletics or being the best mathematicians or whatever it might be. I think the divergent comes in how you, or what your philosophy is, is how you attain that end result. My personal feeling has been we want to win, but I don't think winning is the ultimate goal. I, th I think we want to try to get our people as well prepared to win as possible give them the experience of competition because we think it has a lot to teach uh, young people. And, but I think to play within the rules. I think society is comprised of a set of rules at every turn and we think that athletics is one of those learning experiences where if we learn to play within the rules, we're going to do a much better job in society. Well, as a coach, is it not hard to really live up to this? Because now you yourself are rated by the number of, of wins that, that your team uh, produces. Do you have to uh, talk to yourself about this to, to remind you that, uh, that you shouldn't stress winning too much? Well, I think we stress winning. I don't think there's anything wrong in stressing winning. I think the, what is wrong is winning at any cost or at any price that we prostitute ourselves, perhaps, uh, Maybe we cheat in recruiting if that's one of the methods of gaining the best players so that you can have a winning team. Or possibly teach some type of Ill illegal tactics so you might have an advantage at the, on the opponent. Uh, my personal feeling is we try to teach the people under the guidelines of the rules as we understand them to make them be the best athletes as possible to formulate the best team as possible and then be as successful as possible. We know we're judged on that. And I, I think my feeling has been that if you do that, people are going to understand you better. It, it, you become a questionable person when people become suspect as to what your motives are. And I think people read people in sports pretty well. They know guys that might take a shortcut. And as long as they win, it's hard to criticize them. But when you take shortcuts and don't win, you're probably going to be going down the road. Now, up until I went to Seattle, I coached, I guess, 26 years with no contract, just from year to year. And my philosophy has always been, you know, they can, they can can me anytime anyway. I don't need a contract. I personally have felt that 
you know, I, if I don't do the job, they'll probably get rid of me. I'm going to do the best job I can. I'm going to do the best job for my players I can because that's my responsibility. And with that philosophy, it seems like, you know, we've had good years and bad years, but the people accepted that. Maybe I'm more fortunate than most, but I, I really believe in that, and that's my philosophy of sports. I wonder if I could ask your panel mates for their opinions on the value of competition as an educational tool. How about you, Mr. Kendall? Well, there's no question that <coughs> competition, there's a trem <coughs> tremendous value uh, within the competition. But like Mr. Harshman said, that uh, uh, it's more or less how you go about it. And if you go about it in the right way, it's going to be a very meaningful experience for the, for the young athletes involved. It's going to be a meaningful experience for your booster clubs, for your alumni, and the whole works. But uh, society is to a point where there is a lot of pressure put on winning. And uh, it's not how you play the game. It's rather if you win, you know, this, this type of saying. And, and uh, consequently, this pressure is put on the coaches to a point where maybe they are doing some cheating. And uh, you have to respect the coaches that, that stay within the guidelines, that operate within the guidelines, and yet are still come up to be uh, successful. How about you, Dr. Cutter? Well, I think there's a lot to be learned uh, in participation in sports and competition. Uh, the athlete learns a lot about himself or herself as they compete. Uh, I think these comments about playing by the rules is pretty important because we really don't know if we're doing well at what we're doing, if we really change the game. If you go out to play golf and you don't like where the ball is, so you say, well, we'll kick it out to a little better position. You may be better at something, but not at golf. Dr. Hogan. Along the same lines, and I'll uh, direct this to all the panel members, it was Dr. Hutchins, uh, known for a lot of things in education, but probably in the field of athletics known as the individual that did away with football at the University of Chicago. But uh, Dr. Hutchins' feeling was that if athletics did not help or move towards the direct general objectives of the institution, then it should not be part of the institution. How do you feel, uh, as people involved in athletics at the college level, how do you feel athletics meets the objectives of the institution? Oh, Mr. Harshman. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard for me to understand what the objections of the institution, not just ours, but other institutions really are. And I don't say that facetiously, but I've tried to uh, put that back in the lap of some of the administrative people at the university. One of the things that bothers me is we supposedly have athletics programs probably, first of all, for the participants and probably as much for the student body as, as spectators who become participants in that manner. And yet we almost have come to the point that we want to freeze them out because we want the dollar of the general public so we can have bigger programs. <clears throat> I think the thing that's very difficult for us to do is to get people in the administrative power seats who recognize that the program has to be judged on its value itself. Does it make a contribution to the overall student body? The people playing, the people watching, the so-called esprit de corps that it may create within the student body and within the university community, if that's important, and I've raised this question at the university, if it's not worthwhile, we should get rid of it because I, I get tired of fighting some of the battles that there seems to be no answers and you get uh, some very, well, you don't get any answer from some of the people that should be able to give you the answers. I think if it's worthwhile, it should be funded like anything else. I believe, I've always believed this, that coaches should be part of the faculty, that they should be salaried as faculty people, that they shouldn't be off here in the corner as an elite group. I believe that, always have. I, I'm not in that situation. I fought for that at Washington State. I, I believe, I think that it is a part of the educational process. And for that reason, we should play by the same rules that every other area of the university does. Dr. Cutter. Um, I am in a liberal arts college. And if we trace the liberal arts philosophy back to the times of ancient Greece, we would certainly see that physical education and sporting activity was uh, the norm. The well-rounded person uh, may uh, be able to discuss philosophy and perhaps play on the seven-string lyre or lute or whatever they played. Uh, but he also participated maybe in wrestling or through the discus. Uh, sports were an integral part of the liberal arts, or our integral part of the liberal arts tradition, and um, 
I have no difficulty in defending a sports program, an athletic program, and a liberal arts college. And fortunately, we're in a situation where I think uh, it's pretty well accepted. Mr. Kentop. I, I, uh, I have to concur that you know a athletics are a very inf important function, I, I believe, at the university, and that it is a rallying point around which the alumni, the student body, and everybody kind of associates the whole university and, and like Marv said, gets the spree de corps. But, Yet they have to operate within the same ground rules of the total total student body. You uh, you can't have a grade point uh, for admittance for the athletes and a different one for the students. It, I think they all have to be treated the same, and and there's definitely you know a position for athletics as long as uh, uh, one doesn't overshadow the other. Mr. Williams, I would like to direct my uh, attention to all three gentlemen on the panel. Something uh, from a little different light, but. Uh, again that could be the responsibility of the institution. Uh, <clears throat> there's a great deal of talk today about uh, illegal recruiting and things that are going on in the uh, higher educational circles and uh, some people would think that the responsibility uh, for this lies uh, with the coach and uh, I'm wondering if or what your opinions might be about uh, who is responsible for illegal recruiting. This time we'll start with Mr. Ken Tom. Well I would I, I think a lot of times in illegal recruiting, it could come from overzealous uh, alumni, boosters, but the responsibility still lies, I, I believe, on the coach's shoulders along with the athletic director and that uh, uh, rules have to be followed and maintained and so many times I think you get uh, alumni that want to help you and they really, they really are sincere and, and want to uh, try to get this athlete to attend your university. And, consequently maybe overstep the, the limits that they should be and you, you get the whole program in trouble. And uh, it comes back to the coach's responsibility and the athletic director to get the word to what can be done and what can't be done and to follow these ground rules. Mr. Harsh. 100% concurrence, although I think perhaps uh, uh, there are some other factors, you know, that people get pushed to the wall and I think maybe uh, Raleigh's thinking along these lines a little bit that the coach has been given a dictum that win or else type of thing. So he's having maybe one or two mediocre years and they're more or less told him if you don't have a winning season this you're going to be on the out because he's measured by winning. Now to me that responsibility goes back to the Board of Regents and the administration of that college they have almost forced to the point where they're telling him, we don't care how you win, but you better have a winning team if you want to have a job. And the responsibility maybe should be laid at the, laid at the doorstep of the university president or maybe more justifiably at the Board of Regents. I think what you have to establish, and I've asked um, our vice president in charge of activities who really is over the athletic program, not our athletic director, to give us a mandate as to what do you expect and what do you want and where is the responsibility? Because I believe one of the big problems is that we allow the general public, so to speak, to dictate school policy and athletics rather than the university itself. And I think a lot of times the responsibility, although the coach is responsible and the director is responsible for him and his integrity should keep him from breaking the rules, but sometimes the pressure is so great because he wants that job that he bends the rules to suit the situation and he steps over the line of legality. Mary Lou Reed. Well, Dr. Excuse me, Dr. Cutter, I don't believe in. Well, uh, <laughs> these gentlemen are a, a lot more conversant with this particular topic, but I certainly think that the coach has a major responsibility and. Uh, Sometimes our society, and that society may be, as Coach Harshman said, uh, the administration, the board of trustees of a university, uh, and that needs to be clarified. And uh, if, they're, if they really want to teach uh, students to um, go around the rules, that's what they're going to be doing by requiring their coaches to uh, recruit any way rather than within the framework of the rules. Well, Dr. Cutter, can we stay with you and turn to, okay. to your particular topic, which was sports and the inner self. 
And there is a, a broad in the land today, a tremendous self-awareness movement. People are turning to meditation and to yoga and different ways of finding themselves. And of course, holistic health is another term that, that we hear where people are attempting to find ways to integrate the mind and body. And could you explain how you feel that, that sports are able to, to turn people inward to a better understanding? Um, as long as we see uh, uh, unity in man, um, it seems almost impossible to ignore the physical and uh, the benefits to be derived from participation in sport. Um, this intrinsic evaluation of things, not evaluated by the verdict of the scoreboard, but what we get out of the activity, seems to be something that we really ought to be looking at. And uh, all too often, uh, those of us who are associated with coaching and uh, even uh, on lower levels uh, feel uh, oppressed toward uh, striving for uh, victory. Um, Certainly striving for victory is a, a worthy aim, but if the only value that comes out of a contest is whether we win or lose, then I, I don't think that's the sort of uh, thing that I'd care to be associated with. I think if we can't help uh, young men and women uh, find some other things, uh, the satisfactions, uh, even uh, aesthetic appreciation for participation, uh, those are really where it's at for a lot of people. You talked about the joy of movement as being sort of a, a psychic uh, thrill. Uh, is this something, do you think we have taken the joy out of uh, physical sports by making it too competitive, as you say, uh, but also as make, making it work and taking the fun out? Often. Uh, I referred to some uh, studies that were done by a friend of mine in California uh, evaluating how college athletes felt about their participation. And uh, those who were in high-level scholarship programs, and this was done with football players, um, much less often indicated that they were playing for fun than those who participated in low-level scholarship programs. Uh, the more organized the sport, it appears the less fun there is and the more the extrinsic rewards, the scholarship or whatever the extrinsic rewards may be, are the motive for participation. And uh, that gets away from that uh, joy of effort and the exhilaration of the um, participation. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Hogan. Uh, Dr. Cutter, I'd, I'll direct a statement to you and then ask uh, the other two gentlemen who have had experience uh, at the major college level in, in athletics. Um, you mentioned the, you know, the intrinsic value. You also mentioned the study that was done by your friend uh, did the study also have anything to do with the ability of the individuals involved? For example, uh, it would be a logical assumption that the ability of the individuals at the uh, scholarship level, the ones that were receiving scholarships or other, other funds, had more ability than the individuals at a lower level. Is this... I think that's reasonable to assume. Well, one was a Southeastern Athletic Conference school, the other a school in a low level. And so, with that, then, I would ask the other two gentlemen, uh, what, are, what are their feelings as far as the major college level is concerned with the intrinsic, ex extrinsic values of sport pertaining to the major college athlete? Uh, do you have any thoughts as to, uh, for example, like if it was true, then you could use it in recruiting. <laughs> you could take the individual that was extrinsically motivated and recruit him and forget about the intrinsic individual. Well. I don't know just how to put this, but it's the thing that has bothered me, and I, I used to coach football, and football was my favorite sport. It, isn't, it wouldn't be any longer, I don't know if I'd play it at the college level, because it's, it is now a computerized sport. It's so overly specialized that I, think the, I don't think it is a fun game at the major college level for most players. Maybe if you're the superstar and the recognition and the fulfillment of your ego makes it that way, but for most of the players it isn't. And I think it's because it's a coach's game and the players have little or no choice in what they're going to do. And I've talked about this a number of times. I say that's why I like basketball. Even the coach can't follow it up that much. There's only five timeouts. And once the game starts, it's a player's game. The choices are made by the players. Uh, the satisfaction the coach can get is that hopefully he's done a good enough training job that he's provided some answers for these people 
some choices that they can make and hopefully your teaching has been significant enough that they make the proper choice often enough so your reward is in saying hey I've done a good teaching job I don't think football is that way anymore and I just I don't single out football to say that you know I want to down it but I think this is the problem that we come into in a lot of areas of over specialization I think you can find that probably in other avenues of vocation the same way that you take the fun out because you don't allow enough variance of opportunity. You're, you know, you're just like the guy in the shop that puts the pin in the car every day. I don't think he gets much fun out of that job. He gets his paycheck and that's his reward. But maybe before when he was able to hand tool two or three parts and put it together, it was part of him that was involved. And I think that's the way I feel as a coach. I want to be part of the team because I've given these guys something but you don't have that. It's so specialized in football with ten coaches or whatever it is, and you know each he has two or three guys, and you know he's putting that pin in there. That's about all he has to do. Mr. Kintal. Well, I uh, I think the study probably that Dr. Cutter again was taken, you know, was on on the small college level where non scholarships are are giving or, or where scholarships are not given, and, and, I, and I, it is probably the kids that are turning out for that team are the ones that really want to turn out. Those are, they're, they're not saying, well, if I don't turn out, I'm going to have to go to work and I'm going to have to get some money and help pay for the school. These are kids maybe that just really like the athletics be for the enjoyment part of it. And uh, when you get in the major college level uh, in, say, baseball or, or basketball, it becomes maybe a little more professionalized than maybe it should be. For example, baseball might be run through a fall program, then in a weight program, and then uh, 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 chalk talks. and and things like this throughout the winter to when the spring comes, you're practicing uh, and playing maybe uh, seven days a week. And it becomes very, very much of a job. And for this reason, when kids, uh, when they go to interview somebody like this, they say, yeah, hey, it's a job and it's really hard work and I'm doing it because I get a scholarship. So uh, with that, if, you know, again, if on, a, on a lesser basis, I just don't think that the hard work is involved and I think there's more fun and, and the practices aren't maybe quite so heavy and not so many days in the week. And, not all year round and things like this. I don't think this is to say that those higher programs are necessarily bad, uh, but it does take a different approach and uh, the fun element is less present. Uh, anytime we're looking at a study, I think we all know that it's unique to the particular situation study. And this was done with football using only two schools, whether we get the same results in other sports and at other schools, uh, we really don't know. I think also you find that it still is a choice. He doesn't have to choose a scholarship school. Now, his motivation <clears throat> probably is half play, half reward of the scholarship when he starts out. Maybe it becomes a drag because of overemphasis. But again, a lot of players that I find that want to come to our place or other major universities to play basketball, some of their entire direction is I want to become good enough so I can become a professional. That's their major goal. And the scholarship opportunity enables them to perhaps proceed in that direction. I don't think you would find that as much. That wouldn't be a motivating factor probably in a non-scholarship situation because their level of competency has already been established in their mind. Mr. Williams. I'd like to uh, <clears throat> carry this a bit further and ask you uh, something that I've uh, often thought rather humorous in regard to scholarships, do we give athletes scholarships or do they earn what they get? I would like your reaction to that particular question. Well, Mr. I'd, have, I'd have to say they, they earn what they get, but there's, when we, like this afternoon we we're talking, there's more than just uh, getting an athlete and saying he's a good basketball player, baseball player, and say here's a scholarship. I think most coaches go into more in-depth studies on athletes as far as their character, their citizenship, uh, academics, and things like this. And of course, uh, w primarily when you're looking at an athlete and you're trying to get good athletes, of course you want them to be very, very good. You want to be able to hit the ball a long ways or be able to score or whatever, whatever you're looking for as a coach. But again, you, if you went back, uh, in a way maybe the university has the scholarship available and not so much you're the one that's saying, here you, here you, here you. You're the, you're the person in charge to make a decision to say, okay, he would fit into our program, he's good enough to play, 
this scholarship is available. We will offer this scholarship, and the, the young man has a choice of accepting or rejecting it. If he academically feels the school will better help him, then he, in most cases, may accept it. If, if he feels he can better help himself at another institution, then he may go that way. My thinking was really more along the line of uh, thinking back to the days when I was playing myself, and it was like, uh, gee, they gave you a scholarship. And when you sit down and figure out oh. the amount of time that you put in, uh, I think I figured at one time I could work in a student union and have a great deal more free time than I had on an athletic yeah. scholarship. And a lot more money. I, I, yeah, I we get that from some areas of the university uh, because, as we all know, different colleges within a university has different uh, beliefs and the, the value of their program. There are some jealousies established, and usually athletics, because it's in the limelight, has a lot of fingers pointed at it and sometimes a lot of justification for that. But I've often utilized just exactly what you said, Roy, that, uh, and I've made a study on this. If, if I took my athletes and just took the hours, not counting travel and all that, the turnout hours and the game playing hours, and they went over to Safeway and worked as a box boy, they would make over twice as much money a month and have quite a bit more free time to study than they do for what they get for an athletic scholarship. There is no bargain. What they get beside, monetarily I'm talking about. Of course, can you measure the publicity they get and the opportunity to be presented to the general public and perhaps if they do a good job uh, later on, this opens a lot more doors for them for possible other vocation than the average student. And, and I try to use that as a motivating factor for my players. Say, if you come and do a good job, it's not the fact that you might be all Pac-8, maybe, because you're not all going to be pros, that when you're through, some people are going to give you the opportunity because you've been a varsity athlete and you've also proven yourself academically. You're going to have one more arsenal or one more weapon in your arsenal as far as getting a better opportunity. Cut it, cut it. Um, I'm not sure, Raleigh, when you're talking about uh, earning a scholarship, do you mean something they earned before they came there or earning? Because there's that in... Uh, my thinking there, did this person buy his or her um, a level of competition at the high school level earn that scholarship, something like that? Well, my thinking really is, is uh, arrived at more along the lines when the student is actually at the okay. school and you hear a great deal of, right. uh, of criticism such as the free ride, yeah. athletic free <clears throat> ride. In uh, the schools of our conference, uh, maybe we do give some scholarships because the amount they get is uh, related to financial need and uh, it's related to their academic standing and uh, we probably don't anticipate the same uh, amount of um, oh, I won't say dedication but the same amount of time mm -hmm. is not demanded perhaps soon you're playing in higher levels so um, it's awarded oh, maybe that's the best see I think the awarding going back to the high school period to me I try to equate it you know, if you, had, if you were a good musician, you have a chance for a music scholarship. If you're a uh, National Merit Scholar, you're probably going to get a, uh, some uh, financial remuneration without doing anything once you're there except the fact you were fortunate enough to be intelligent to qualify. I think if you have the abilities in any area where there are opportunities to go on to college and get some rewards for it, I don't think that's a gift. I think you've earned that up to that point. And then, then when you're measured in college, then you continue to earn it by the effort you put in. Or if you don't do the job, certain schools may drop you right at that point. It's the same way in the academic areas. Gentlemen, I have a question that certainly is a great problem, uh, as I see it, at the collegiate level. And that is, so many players that come into uh, major universities, anyway, Mr. Harshman, you probably have had to face this problem more than the other guests. That is, that so many individuals come in with the expectations and anticipation that they're going to be not only successful there, but are going to be successful professionally and make a living at the sport. And then they become disillusioned when, for whatever the reasons may be, they are not successful. And um, one of our guests yesterday even made the point that uh, he had seen uh, individuals' lives ruined or, in some cases, suicide uh, come out of, although there may be many other implications that cause that. Uh, how do you as coaches deal with this if you, if you see this possibly developing that you have the ability to encourage the player but yet 
not get their expectations so high that there'll be a psychological um, damage as a result of not making it. Mr. Harshman, let's start with you. Well, I think you'd, you'd try to be as realistic as, as possible from the start. You, and I tell my players, you know, you wouldn't be here if we didn't think you were an exceptional physical talent and a uh, fine character and all the qualities that we think important in our program. But here we have 15 people on scholarship and 12 can be on the traveling squad and only five can play at a time. So right away, uh, there's only a third of you are, in your minds, maybe going to be successful. And out of all the guys that play, maybe 3% of the college players, they say, make it to the pros. Now, they always think they're going to be one of those 3%, but I think you have to lay it out for them ahead of time to try to get them to be somewhat realistic. The most difficult thing is, and, I, and we talk about this, is to be a substitute. But it's in just as sure as we're sitting here, two-thirds of the guys are going to be substitutes. The most, and I try to make substitute role an important one. Say the most difficult and probably the most important role is that of a substitute. It's a unique situation because all of a sudden, in a very important time in a contest, the coach calls you, you go at the game with no warm-up or anything, you have to play to the complete limit of your ability, top 100%, and then you have to be restricted because the one thing I tell my players, you have to play to your talent, but play within your limitations. And that's the most difficult role at, at a starter. You allow him more freedom. He's a starter. He's already a guy and you question, you criticize him mentally, but not openly. But it's very difficult for a coach not to put extra pressure on a substitute. You're a second-rate citizen designated by the role of substitute. Now you put him in the game to save the game or maybe to win the game in your own mind, although we try not to tell him that. I, I always tell my players, a substitute never wins the game. But by the same token, he never loses the game. We want you to maintain the status quo. Maybe give a guy a rest. Maybe do one thing we're not doing very well. If you can accept that role, you can be more valuable than any starter. And I believe that. I think you have to make that point in your program important for everybody. Everybody then has an important role. The guys not starting are just important. Fifteenth man, sixth man. Mr. Kentuck. I, I was very good. I, I really sincerely believe what Marv is saying about a coach being realistic. So many kids I know come into a baseball situation where they played Little League and Babe Ruth and Legion in high school and, and uh, the only thing that's been in their mind is they want to maybe become a professional baseball player. And yet the percentages of young men in the big leagues that make it are very small. And I think you have to keep uh, uh, telling these young men that, you know, what the percentages are, what their chances are, yet not discourage them either. And yet I think that because a kid uh, or a young man or whatever comes into athletics with aspirations of being a professional and doesn't make it, doesn't make him to be a, a suicidal candidate. I, I just, you know, I think that he could uh, conceivably be a better man for it and go out in society and, and do a heck of a lot better job. Well, if uh, Coach Harshman's figures of 3% uh, at the major university level that make it into the pros, it's a much lower percentage <laughs> from our level. Uh, I think this helping them to set realistic levels of aspiration is pretty important. And uh, maybe that's why um, it's important that uh, we get a lot of the personal values out of it, because it isn't going to be a living for very many of them. Uh, and yet, as uh, Coach Kentop said, uh, you need to kind of hold that uh, hope out for the exceptional ones. This past year, we had a very fine football player at Whitworth, uh, signed with the Seahawks as a free agent, and he's made the squad. Doug Long, some of you may have seen him play. Uh, and. Uh, Doug uh, was, uh, went to that camp uh, hoping and, uh, that he'd make that club, uh, determined that he'd make that club, but still uh, Doug had other options. And he knew that it was a real possibility that he wouldn't. As a free agent, that the, the possibility was really remote. He's made it, but he had plans for doing other things, and I think that's what we have to do is help people to see that's not the only out. See, we've had a lot of people recruited maybe with uh, the professional athlete um, goal in mind and uh, 
if they don't get that out of their mind with the help from the coach, uh, they may be doomed to some real disappointments and, and problems they can't cope with. Ladies and gentlemen, we have three guests today. First is Mr. Larry Kentop, Athletic Director at Gonzaga University. Secondly, Mr. Marv Harshman, the basketball coach at the University of Washington, and Dr. Ross Cutter, tennis coach at Whitworth College. We'll continue the questioning in the next series from Mary Lou Reed. Gentlemen, we've been talking about sports that, that have a lot of pressure <clears> in them. Are there any sports in particular that are more relaxing than others? And is re relaxation a, a goal? I think that we always use the example of the long distance runner, the marathon, as one who goes into some sort of a state of self-hypnosis self toward his 26th mile. Uh, is this something that you see as a a worthwhile goal and something that uh, the, the relaxation, is this something you, you aim for? Can we start with you, Mr. Kenhart? Sure. I, I, th I think as a coach, first of all, you try to teach all athletes to play relaxed, but uh, back to the, the coaching aspect, I, I think that most coaches put, whether you're coaching cross country or your uh, golf or in your major program in basketball, a good coach usually puts a lot of pressure on himself. And uh, sure, he may, uh, in a large program, say in basketball, University of Washington, Marv has a lot of pressure from uh, alumni and boosters, but probably the, as much of pressure is put on by himself, wanting to do well. He probably has set goals and, and is trying to get to them, too. And I, this is where I say that even a golf coach, as much as it may be relaxed, you send your six men out to play golf, and you sit in the clubhouse and wait for them to come in, I think the, the, still a good golf coach is putting pressure on his shoulders that the kids are performing well. He has butterflies. The adrenaline's probably going through the coach. He's worried about the match. So I think whatever level of competition, you know, there is that certain pressure put on by himself. Dr. Cutter? Uh, I think Larry's right. Uh, even in uh, something as uh, out of the public eye as college tennis at the Northwest college level, uh, I suppose the coach often is really concerned and a little more nervous. Maybe the coach's main role uh, at that point is not to uh, convey that feeling to some of the players. That is, that uh, to psych them uh, or get them in a psychological state and make it a little bit more of, of the match than uh, they've already made in their own minds can be a well, are there methods? To are there method methods to uh, achieve this in which uh, you really have ways to promote relaxation with your players? Or I, I'm sure it's not enough to say, relax. <laughs> uh, that may not. be the hardest thing to do, say relax and then expect them to. I think uh, your own approach to things helps an awful lot. Um, but there is no particular standardized uh, procedure that has been developed like oh, repetition? I know of teams that uh, uh, last spring, we took a trip to California, and one of the schools that we played against down there, their whole team got in a circle, and uh, they did uh, some kind of meditative yoga type of behavior, which they uh, felt was a, a means by which they uh, relaxed. But a lot of this is very personal. I think uh, some uh, athletes uh, will like to be alone. Others will like to engage in light conversation. Uh, it may not always be relaxing them, but it's uh, preparing them mentally for the... Some probably have to be psyched up and others psyched down. Well, I think that's my personal approach. I don't believe you can really treat any two athletes on your team the same as far as motivating them or as, as far as trying to get them in the proper state of mind, which relaxation is. I think if there is a state you want them relaxed, but keyed to the point of expectation of what is going to be demanded of them. Now, that's a strange parallel, but that's true, I think, and I think it's possible. Uh, a lot of uh, squads we know, uh, you know, they have a prayer before they go out on the field or on the court. Uh, some of them have, uh, you know, somebody leads them. They think this is going to prepare them. I let my players try to get themselves mentally. We have a quiet period. I don't know if they I tell them, you can say a prayer, you can say whatever you want. And we have about two minutes in our locker room before we go out where we think it's kind of introspective. We're, we're, we're looking to find out what the demands we feel are on each one of ourselves, coaches and players, before we go on the court to play. 
we're mentally going to get ourselves prepared. It might be some guys so tight that he's got to be relaxed. Sometimes you sense that, and you make some kind of a joke about it, and the guys bust up, and you know you have you go out. Maybe you think over relaxed, but that's done the job. Sometimes they're so. Uh, what we, we play, uh, say they're skylarking around the locker room, and you know they're not ready mentally, and maybe you got to get on them and chew somebody. Maybe you got to shock them by jumping some guy. It just happened. He has to, happens to be the guy that's most available. You may not be angry with him at all, but you use a whipping boy. So there is no one time that's the same as another. And so I think you, you get a feel of this. That's what a coach becomes, kind of a um, amateur psychologist, I guess you would say. But relaxation as an in product is something that you can't afford in, in a competition. And that's something that has to come individually later. I, I think so. I uh, think a coach, I was going to say, I think a coach can certainly help with some kids, like, you know, coaching as, as coaching maturity experience the more he gets into it the more longer he's a coach the more i think he becomes successful with handling his athletes you know with the relaxing part there's a, a matter of how much relaxation and how much tension is desirable um, if the player or the competitor is too relaxed they won't play up to their capacity uh, on the other hand, uh, if the anxiety level or tension level gets too high, then we uh, inhibit performance in the other. Uh, that's why we have some players who are really good practice players. Uh, the anxiety level gets a little too much in the competition, and they don't play nearly as well. Or others who are perhaps not as uh, uh, up high enough in their tension level during practice, but uh, the coach sends them in as a substitute in the game, and they're the money player. They uh, perform best under pressure because they're able to take uh, a greater amount of pressure in there. Some sort of ideal state of happy tension. Yeah, that's about what it is. Uh, Dr. Hogan. The, uh, after the Mexico City Olympics, why the material that was turned out for athletics seemed to be in the area of conditioning and, and um, training at high altitude. And the word is that after the next Olympics, the ones in Russia, that the big word will be just exactly what we're talking about now, and that is the psychological aspects of sport, and whether it makes a difference or doesn't make a difference. Uh, I would like to get off that subject for a minute, though, and get to one that uh, seems to be the big one as far as papers are concerned, and that is, of course, the, the NC2A and, uh, and the rules and regulations put down upon institutions at a national level. Uh, what are the feelings of you gentlemen, uh, especially Mr. Kentup, Mr. Harshman, uh, as to the NC2A and the fact that they have taken a lot of the power and a lot of the control away from universities and put it at the, at the, at the major uh, national level? Well, first of all, the, there could be some uh, big changes, I think, this coming NCAA convention where they're talking about going into a major type conference for football. But uh, I don't know so much uh, less if, if things have changed. The, the power is still in the NCA. The, the guidelines and the rules are written by the schools. The faculty representatives which uh, represent the schools at the national meetings are the ones that are making these rules. Uh, sometimes all the rules or the rules that are made just don't fit all the schools. And uh, each particular school could sit back and say, well, gee whiz, this, that's a stupid rule and it sure doesn't fit us. But yet they had a voice and a hand in making that rule. And if we don't like the rule, the rule can be changed. And it's, sometimes it's not easy, but they can be changed. And it's, it's like in politics, I guess. And so uh, you have the rules. Sometimes uh, you don't like the rules, but you have to live by the rules. The thing that I've been quite concerned, uh, almost the same way as Larry, uh, the lay public generally, and a classic example is uh, uh, I happened to be in Hawaii a few weeks ago when the Tarkanian situation came in the press and there was an article by a representative, James Santini, a representative of the U.S. Senate from Nevada, who announced uh, to the press that he was going to get the House uh, Investigating Committee to investigate the NCA because he didn't feel anybody should have any power to be able to ascertain whether people were living up to the rules or not. That was the institution's problem. And it kind of irritated me. I wrote him a letter. I mean, I didn't write him a nasty letter, but I tried to write him an informative letter because I said almost the same thing that Larry did, that 
the coaches have no vote in the NCAA, the athletic directors have no vote, it's the faculty people through the presidents that have the vote. They determine the rules. They set it up as institutions which they think we should abide by, all of us. And, and I think it's just like uh, the speed rules. There's people who are going to break them. I think it's necessary to have a governing body like the NCA. I think it's necessary to have so-called speed cops along the way, if for no other reason than the fact that when we know a guy is there with radar, we go 55. If we think we're out by Othello and there are none, we might go 70. Well, we're more dangerous at 70 than we are at 55. And I think that analogy holds true with sports. We need to have the restrictions that are imposed by the NCAA. I, I think it would be a sad day when we, if we would get away from having this type of a governing body. Uh, Dr. Cutter, along that same line, one of the things I know that the uh, NCAA is considering is the scholarship by need on a need basis. And I know that uh, at your institution and in the conference that you've been in, you've had this for a few years. Has, uh, has it actually been successful or does it work? Um, we seem to be fairly well pleased by it. There are a couple of regulations that uh, are difficult because the people who get penalized under this are the really good student and good athlete who has uh, no need. We've had examples in the past few years uh, because of rules in our league that students have had to return academic scholarship money in order to be eligible to participate in sports. And this seems to penalize, say, the good student. But overall, uh, I think the important thing overall is that you're competing with schools that are operating in the same way you are. And our league has chosen to be a uh, need basis scholarship league. And uh, the Evergreen Conference, which is the s sort of sister conference with whom we would compete in non-league games mostly, operates the same way. So we feel that, uh, in essence, we're competing with teams that are recruiting and uh, on the same basis. Uh, I'm sure that we aren't aspiring to play uh, University of Washington as fine an institution as it is because they operate on a, on a different basis or other schools of that nature. Raleigh Lee. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, get back to uh, some individual aspects of, in, of athletics in general and possibly get some opinions from you gentlemen on what you think differentiates between the good and the great athlete. Mr. Kentop? It's a tough question. So many times I think the, uh, it's, it's who's calling who good and who's calling who great, you know, and, and uh, sometimes the great athlete is, is so, many, so many cases, is God-given. Uh, this athlete may have been uh, a super athlete all the way up the line, and, and uh, you, come as a, you get him as a coach, and you just hope that you don't mess him up in any way and let him, let him develop his abilities and let him... Uh, uh, you, you try to teach him some skills and uh, still but don't hold the lid on him so that he can develop you know his 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 top goal uh, let's say the good athlete may not may not quite have the god-given ability and and yet had such a uh, has worked himself to a point where uh, maybe he's become a very adequate college player uh, maybe working the weight program maybe just spending a lot of time in the program a lot of dedication desire but uh, so many times, I, I don't think that uh, somebody's going to become a great athlete just from just hard work. There's got to be some God-given ability to them. Mr. Harshman. I really don't know what else to say. I've, I've often felt that I've seen some very good athletes by nature of their natural talents. They have not thought the game well, and they don't progress much above what they were when you got them because they're content to be successful at that level. I've seen some people become good athletes who have not had really enough physical talent to be a college player. And I think we can all cite guys who you said, I don't I had a kid once, I said, don't come to Washington State. You can't make our team. His brother play, it would happen to play for you, so I'm gonna come. He made our freshman squad. I said, you ought to transfer. He makes our varsity squad. He wasn't good enough to play but he wouldn't allow me not to let him play. He worked so hard, he became such a student of the game, 
He overcame the areas of deficiency. He probably played closer to his capacity of any player I ever had, and yet he was never more than the third, team, uh, third guard on our team. I've had other players, and so have you, who, you know, might maybe were six men when they came in, there were six men when they left, or seventh man. I think the great player is one who has the latent talent, physical talent, but then perhaps has put the intelligence, uh, uh, set some goals, uh, conceivable goals that he can attain, worked hard to get there, and has become a great athlete. I think a great athlete is a combination of uh, hard training, intelligence, and a lot of uh, God-given abilities. It seems that heredity sets the limits. There's no doubt of that, that uh, no matter how hard some could train, they'd never achieve what others would do with just a little bit of training. But then in environment determines how close we come to that potential, and that environment includes the uh, encouragement, maybe within the family and the school, the coaching they receive, and then those things that the individual contributes, the desire, the motivation, the dedication, and we put all those together, and sometimes we come up with a great athlete. Mary Lou Reed. Mr. Kentop, you have had a lot of experience with Little League, and you told the students that you felt uh, mostly positive things about it, even though uh, the press and publicity generally has been fairly critical of Little League in, in uh, recent times. Would you tell us and our viewers some of the, the positives and the negatives as you see them in Little League? Well, first of all, I, you know, to retract a little bit, I haven't had a tremendous amount of background in Little League, although when I was in California, I was on the board and officers and things like this and, and involved, but uh, there's been so much written negative about Little League that it, it kind of upsets me to the point that uh, it seems like if we're going to publicize something, let's get something in the paper that the people will read. And uh, instead of writing maybe about uh, Johnny Bench saying that uh, Little League has a lot of good qualities that uh, the kids are learning how to win, how to lose, how to compete. Uh, they're learning discipline. They may write, Johnny Bench said that you get a bad elbow from throwing a curveball. So that'll be uh, on the Associated Press wire from New York to, to the San Francisco, and, and this is what comes out. And, and maybe if, again, if Johnny Bench would have said that uh, the good positive points from Little League uh, it won't come in the paper. It'll be in a, a baseball publication of some type, maybe, and very few readers will read it. But my association still, from Little League and being involved in the little part that I have been, I, I certainly believe that there are a lot of positive aspects. And, and the few that I mentioned there, along with the uh, learning the game and what have you, that uh, Little League has built itself to a point to, uh, that uh, if the coaches really have a, a in-depth type of philosophy and what they really believe and it's understood within the program that they're not going to destroy the kids, they're not going to hurt kids, but if you get a, a coach there that uh, wins at all costs at this level, then I think the, the leader of the Little League has to control it. Well, you yourself had a minor horror story when you talked about the minor major uh, Little League mm -hmm. and the, the major major Little League and right. the, the kids being uh, sort of auctioned off like cattle. Right. Uh, so there certainly are instances of, of the you abuse. But yet, but yet uh, uh, it still works. It, you know, when, when parents get involved, they want to get too organized sometimes. And when sometimes we get too organized, we get too professionalized. But yet with the major Little League and the minor Little League, it's still there are more children, more kids involved playing. There were kids, no, no young man was ever cut from a Little League team. They always had an opportunity to go play. You know, this, this is always cited that it's important for children to learn to lose and to learn to fail. And I'm not sure exactly when you're supposed to start learning to lose. This is maybe at, right. the, at the moment you're born. Or is there a, a, a better time? And there is some question as to whether or not a structured, organized uh, sport such as, as baseball and Little League is the best way for a young person to be spending his or, or her time. Uh, who, when, when should you start to lose? That's right. Who is to say, who who is to say uh, when they should start learning to win and lose? You know, at five years old or 15 years old, you know, or, you know, who, who, who is to really say this? And uh, sooner or later, I believe that uh, children have to learn this. They have to face up to it. That they're not going to win everything that they uh, have set forth to get. And they're going to have to learn uh, a loss, and that's going to have to be to them kind of a temporary setback, that they're going to have to go back, regroup, and be able to come at it again. And if they do this successfully and keep coming at things, uh, you know, they're going to be successful in life. I think what uh, Coach Kentop said is really related to, to leadership. 
the key to any of these programs seems to me to lie in leadership. Uh, and philosophically, I, I can take a lot of exceptions to Little League and uh, some of the things that uh, I have heard and in some cases have observed uh, happen. Uh, yet uh, we have two boys, both of whom went through not Little League per se, but junior baseball programs. And uh, I could say the experiences they had were very positive. But I know of kids playing on other teams within the same league uh, who had negative experiences. And I attribute to the leadership, the coaching, uh, the kind of people that were more interested in kids than they were in um, how well they performed. I don't mean they weren't taught anything. I just mean that the, the uh, outcomes for the youngster were more important than the, the win and loss record. Uh, some really good things happened to our kids under some really uh, good kinds of leadership. The thing that I think worries me the most about those kind of programs, the highly competitive, highly structured program for youngsters, is the um, intensive demands on their time that channel them into one activity, often because their peer group are participating, and keep them from coming in contact with other things where they may be more successful. So that if a youngster gives a lot of time to swimming or to basketball or to baseball or to hockey, whatever it may be, uh, and is only mediocre, uh, if he puts that much time into one thing, he may not come in or she may not come in contact with some other things which could be the most satisfying to them. I think it's a little early to specialize. They may be missing some, some good fishing at that Right, at even that good point. fishing. I think I'd like to take a little bit of different tack. I think the one thing it could te teach from the positive standpoint is maybe we might do a better job of teaching parents the value of why we're having Little League. You know, a lot of places, in order to have someone in there, you have to be involved yourself, which is good, I think, if, particularly if you're not involved with your own offspring. And you learn a lot of humility there if you have to umpire a little league, which I can remember doing very, uh, doing it quite often and not very well. The, the thing that, uh, when you mentioned about the fact that when are you ready to fail, you know, we're, we have people going to uh, Head Start programs in school and nursery school. Now, how old are they? I, nursery school, can, you can be three years old and go. And they're not, they have to make some, uh, they have to learn some situations there that may not be great failures or successes, but they have to learn that maybe everything isn't going to go their own way. I think there is a period of uh, maybe when we're too young to really get involved in a lot of things. I told the school administrator once, I think instead of having head start, we should have hold back. I think there are a lot of young people that aren't ready for a lot of things. So again, I don't know if there's a magic age of six or seven or ten or wherever it is. I think it's... Uh, when the young person evidences a desire to get involved. And I think that goes back to the parental situation. You have to read your own children and maybe evaluate what's good for them. With that, I have to interrupt. Our time is up. And I want to express our appreciation to all three of you for a very fine program. Thank you. Ladies Thank you. and gentlemen, we've had three guests uh, this evening. Mr. Larry Kintop, athletic director at Gonzaga University. Mr. Marv Harshman, the basketball coach at the University of Washington, and Dr. Ross Cutter, the tennis coach at Whitworth College. May I invite you to be with us again the same time next week on this station when again we'll be discussing a significant issue. This is your moderator, Tony Stewart, wishing you a good evening. <laughs>